All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think there were some some really interesting post discussion conversations happening. Uh, let's move on to the next panel discussion. As I mentioned, Parker Fredland, Jeff Jones, Younes Dure, and uh, Jenny Rodenhaus will be participating. Um, Parker and Jeff will will introduce themselves um, first. Uh, Younes will be calling in, beaming in from uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, and uh, Jenny uh, will zoom in as well. Um, and we're looking forward to um, a great conversation with uh, with this um, amazing group of people on the topic on the topic of XR and education and education for XR. Uh, I will welcome Parker for his presentation. Uh, you have a few minutes to tell us about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Parker Fredland. Um, and excited to be here today. Uh, Safir, thanks for bringing us together to kind of talk about a topic that um, I've really spent a lot of time uh, investing uh, you know, my personal knowledge in and, and have really tried to transfer that to my professional career, um, which is kind of like something you guys talked about a little bit in the last thing, like really focus on things you're passionate about and try to turn those into you know, career opportunities. Or um, you know, I think people know that that comes across very easily if they know that you're really invested in, in an area. So uh, let me click through here and I'll give my quick background. Um, I'm currently working full time at Volvo, uh, which for me uh, has been an awesome experience just to be in the car design uh, industry. I graduated from Art Center in 2007. Uh, in the undergrad car design program. Um, and that was kind of always where my passion was, just to kind of figure out how to create cars, you know, sketching in your notebook, kind of in high school, typical kind of story. But uh, I didn't know about Art Center until I was like 19. And the minute I came out here and saw it, I was like, I've got to go there. Um, and, and basically moved out to California to start that journey. Um, and I do teach um, part-time at Art Center. Um, but around that time, like maybe before Art Center here, I, I, my first job out of school was with 3D Excite, uh, formerly a company called RTT. And there's still a software called Delta Gen, which is here at school. Uh, it's a real-time rendering software. And that's really where I uh, was able to get my first start in, in, uh, in my career. And it was basically taking 3D data and making photorealistic visualizations using this real-time software. Um, and there's a lot of new softwares on the market that do this kind of thing. But at the time, this is a really revolutionary tool. Um, and I took some of that knowledge uh, when I was asked by Jeff Wardle to come join the graduate transportation design program um, and try to teach these digital tools to the students to figure out how they can um, you know, create their visions for, for a transportation um, uh, world. And so a lot of the skills that I'll, I'll show you in a minute, some visual examples, but really taking students through examples of like just how do you model something in 3D? How do you render it in 3D? How do you make animations and, and just make it come to life and tell a better visual story? Um, and my work at Volvo basically kind of, the visualization world is where I got my start, but I, I, I found myself always being at the end of the process and only making visualization for you know models that kind of were given to you. And so I wanted to find a way back to working in a car design studio, but also maybe getting more hands-on and creating things myself that I can also then model and, and create uh, compelling uh, visuals for. Um, so I'll show, show some examples here um, of kind of the work. But early on in my, my visualization career, um, worked with large teams creating really high-end marketing uh, imagery and videos for product launches, uh, car configurators, and things of that nature. Uh, but using Delta Gen, as an interactive tool allowed us to kind of do more interactive experiences where you can actually spin the car around and change the colors and open the doors and, and kind of build these like promotional product experiences for a lot of different brands. Um, after spending a lot of time in automotive, we did start looking at like other industries that could use these same tools, but we found that that workflow wasn't really established. So we spent a lot of time working at like um, shoe companies like Vans, and this is where I met Saphir. Um, uh, New Balance, uh, Deckers, Skechers, a few others to name some brands, but trying to figure out what their process would look like to go from a sketch to a 3D model and try to identify what those benefits are for that company. And this is basically the first 360 uh, configurator for New Balance that was on their website. And we also did some in-store kiosks as well that were all real-time rendered. And also got into some soft goods uh, with Target, trying to figure out how they can digitize their products and really figure out fitment, 
color, pattern, materials in a much faster way than they could do with traditional prototyping, which is always sending out for physical samples and waiting for those to come back. And if I fast forward to kind of what I'm able to do now um, uh, at Volvo, it's using not Delta Gen, I kind of moved over to Autodesk V-RED, uh, which is a software I've been teaching my students for, for a while, but the process is the same. Import the data, apply materials and shaders on it, put it in a compelling visual world, and then we need to fly around these vehicles. This is a movie, but most times we're flying around it in real time. And we're looking at millimeter differences between like uh, design lines or maybe the proportion of something. And we want to look really close at all those kind of details. You're seeing a previous generation S60 and then a current one. Uh, but once we get this far in the process, our next step would be to allow users to see it in a virtual reality space. So putting on the headsets and walking around the vehicles. And in many cases, like, and I'll expand on this maybe later on um, in the panel discussion, but making it easy enough for people to understand what to do, uh, what to click on, what they should look at next, um, and learn something about this product that we're you know, spending weeks and months designing. Um, and some other areas that I've been able to work on early on in my time at Volvo is just animating user interfaces. Um, this one was done for a CES show um, where the animations I created were kind of put into the car um, with a marketing and production team, um, blue screen, actors, the whole bit. So kind of, you know, you might work on one cool digital portion of something that will get included into a larger area. And we did a product launch in 2020 um, where we launched this concept TO, uh, which is that tall vehicle. It's a vehicle that you basically step right into. So I got to create some compelling visuals for that um, using V-RED, uh, just something a little more playful as opposed to being like very photo real. And I'll try to wrap up uh, with this last few slides as it relates to kind of what I do here at Art Center with the students is that they're not a huge team. There's not 10, 20 people that can make these really awesome uh, visuals. It's what can you do as an individual person? And I try to take them through exercises to model something, uh, to render it, and ultimately produce movies that they can put into their presentations. Um, and in some cases, it's the smaller uh, mobility solution. In other cases, it's uh, creating an entire world uh, and, and telling a larger mobility uh, solution or story. Um, and we do a lot of Photoshop exercises as well. This is kind of a standard thing that even in the industry, trying to imagine like the next vehicle, you always want to kind of Photoshop something over that back plate. And I'll take them through compositing exercises just to produce a nicer final image. Um, because you can only get so far in 3D rendering. Sometimes you got to get in there and actually do a little bit of manual labor. And the last one here that I uh, wanted to share that I'll take my students on is uh, the creation of uh, user interfaces. So how do you animate things? It's, it's no longer just static graphics that, for me, will help tell the story. Uh, you need to put things in motion. And that's another thing that I try to uh, introduce to the students in the kind of two terms that I um, get to work with them in the graduate transportation systems and design program. OK, I might have went over my three minutes, but thank you very much. Thank you, Parker. All right, you can you can take a, a seat here. Jeff Jones, the floor is yours. That was awesome. Thanks, Parker. Let's see. So uh, my name is Jeffrey B. Jones, and I'm an Art Center instructor and Art Center alum, and also a freelance idea working with many startups uh, in the Bay Area. So the bulk of my career was spent at Samsung Design America in San Francisco, working with a world-class team of product strategists, industrial designers, and a UX team. It was a really cool and creative spot to work at. Um, we had two amazing offices in downtown San Francisco and uh, constantly working with uh, the design team in Korea, trying to come up with new and exciting product categories um, that Samsung could get into. Um, this is just a big splash screen of uh, a lot of the products I helped bring to life as a lead industrial designer. So mobile phones, uh, tablets, fitness wearables, smart watches. And, you know, I learned a lot, uh, you know, working with engineers and really bringing these products to life. Um, our team was really looking at uh, you know, this kind of on me products like watches, um, in ear hearables and uh, wrist based, uh, you know, fitness related products. 
But we also, you know, aside from shipping products, we're also asked to look at, you know, emerging technologies such as AR. And Samsung is currently working with lots of different startups to figure out what that technology means uh, for us as individuals. And so I learned a lot about the constraints of hardware and augmented reality. Um, but then moving on from Samsung, uh, I've had a lot of great experiences working with various startups. And one of my favorite is uh, Volt Post. And what they're looking to do is, you know, expand the electric charging infrastructure into places where it's really tough to charge, such as the city of New York, right? And so the concept here is in order to reduce the cost of getting this stuff out there, um, retrofitting the existing lampposts and using the conduits um, that are already there as opposed to trenching and basically just increasing access to electric vehicle charging um, throughout the world. But I would say my primary role these days is working with the Art Center students. And I really love, um, you know, teaching a, a lot around, you know, consumer electronic design, 3D modeling. And one of my big missions was really to help students capture the beauty of their sketch in their 3D models. And so, you know, as designers, we're always looking at, you know, inspiration and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find that right inspiration image. And I had one student named Dewey, Dewey Yu, who did this amazing project around how do you um, literally design your own inspiration image, right? So this project is about um, utilizing StyleGAN, which is a, a machine learning algorithm that mixes these images together to get new kind of fake images. So for example, you could see if you mix, you know, Barack Obama's face with Ryan Gosling's face, you get this face in the middle, right? So imagine if you wanted to design this interesting chair inspired by a bird, he took a ton of images of birds, a ton of images of chairs, and used the style GAN to kind of mix those together. And then he got these generated image that you see in the top left, and then utilizing analog sketching and gravity sketch to create you know, a pretty unique and super well-executed uh, design of a chair. And what's cool is when you look at this, you don't you know, necessarily see that it was designed by a bird or, you know, inspired by a bird. But I think it's just a really cool example of um, utilizing, you know, this new technology to create uh, unique inspiration images. So not only did he do the bird chair, but he also thought, well, what about the bird kettle? And so rinsed the images in the same way, um, did the analog sketch, did the gravity sketch, and then uh, 3D modeling in SolidWorks to come up with, you know, really sleek uh, design for a kettle, electric kettle that, you know, w he wouldn't have thought of if he didn't mix those images together. And the last experiment um, is, well, what if you get rid of the birds and instead you put in these angular images and mix it with the kettle? And so you have the generated images and then he chose the one that he liked the most in the up upper left. And then same process of analog sketching, gravity sketch, and refinement in SolidWorks, 3D modeling. And the final result was this super interesting kettle that's kind of split in half between softer, more human forms that you can touch versus this rigid kind of cold and would eventually be really hot uh, stainless steel stuff happening in the front. And so for me, the reason why I think this is a really cool example for the conversation is how students are utilizing these new technologies to kind of innovate the process itself and not rely on the tech to design it for you. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. When I first saw these, um, you know, this project, I was like, you know, this is exactly what, what it's about. It's about, um, you know, Playing, experimenting, and 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 continuing uh, to uh, to try new things, and I'm sure we'll have uh, some some great some great topics of conversation about that. Um, the next participant is, as I mentioned before, um, calling in from Morocco, halfway around the world. Hello, Younes, can you hear us? Hello. So yes, I call from uh, Morocco. So just for you. This is America, so just for you to see, I'm the not the other side of the world, but I'm North Africa, 
and in uh, in this city called Marrakech, uh, which the 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 this city is known for having a, a craft, uh, absolutely amazing craft, and it's where with my sister we uh, we started our company uh, called Younes Dure Design, and this is our office in Marrakech. And it's it's where we work. We built this office uh, in, uh, in. We started our company in 2005. I was. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, I, I'm born in Morocco from a French father and a Moroccan mother, and I studied in France in Paris in a design school called Lancy Les Ateliers, and then we came back to Morocco. Uh, so as I said in 2005 to start the company, and uh, we worked with a different kind of. Um, of company, uh, um, national company with uh, uh, international company. And the idea is always the same is uh, they, they ask us to be creative, to be innovative and to try to, um, to, to come with our knowledge and uh, our inspiration from this uh, civilization, from this culture, from the Arabic uh, civilization and, uh, and this culture. Uh, also, we did uh, lots of, um, of lecture, I did lots of lecture, lots of workshop around the theme of uh, um, the vision of being creative and innovative in, uh, in uh, through the lens of uh, of another civilization, of another culture, and it's very interesting to see how you can uh, you can twist the idea of design using uh, another way of seeing the product and seeing innovation, and I did uh, uh, this is some of the project I've done uh, for different kinds of companies. So furniture, I did also set design, what we call scenography for museum, for uh, for exhibition, uh, brand, brand identity, I've designed a watch, the different kind of product. It can be like 3D printing using, I have two 3D printers in, uh, in the office. So I use a lots of uh, prototypage, ra rapid prototyping, sorry, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, experimenting new way of uh, of, of um, creating product so also retail design shop design and everything so it's um, it's really uh, wide the, the 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 spectrum of project we are doing in our studio and we work a lot with lots of uh, of brand but the the thing is like always um we we the, the cool thing about being in marrakech and being in morocco it's we have an amazing craft uh, craftsmen who, who, who master their uh, their uh, their technique and uh, and it's always very interesting to go from the digital to the analog and uh, and being with those people like understanding the, the 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 materials how to react how the material is reacting and everything so it's really interesting to have this uh, this uh, this knowledge and to understand this knowledge but in the same time we use a lot uh, um, digital tools and for example this video I took this video a few uh, few days ago because I work on the project uh, and uh, and I use uh, uh, augmented reality so it's um, it's a product I design and this is it's in my office and we we showed the product inside of the of the space for people to understand the size and everything and we realized that it's very interesting because I thought that craftsmen they, they couldn't understand this kind, not understand, but uh, not used to uh, this kind of tools and will not uh, um, uh, look at the, the product and, and be able to, 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 to really grasp the, the where I want to go. And, um, and actually, they feel way more comfortable with augmented reality than a 3D render that can, I can show, I can print, and I can show them. So um, I know that now when I do a project with clients and I have to work with craftsmen and to create new uh, furniture, new product, uh, working on the space, I use a lot of uh, my, uh, basically, uh, my phone and, uh, and, uh, and everything because... Um, uh, it's it's very uh, it's very interesting how with the augmented reality it's very interesting to see um, the the fact that they are very uh, um, very used to this kind of tool and they they can understand a lot that when uh, they, they you use this tool and you you put your design in the middle and they can turn around we can compare the three D the three D uh, uh, object 
next to the to the to the actual product. So it's really interesting to see um, the link between the, the the digital and the analog. Voilà. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ines. Um, always fun seeing all the, the, the projects he's working on. Um, and our final participant, Jen Rodenhaus, uh, will take a few minutes to introduce herself. Most of us know her. First, super excited to be here and excited to join the conversation. And um, I'll just share a bit of my background and what I hope to contribute today to the discussion. Um, my background's industrial and interaction design. And for a long time, I was at Microsoft and Xbox and Microsoft Research. And from that experience, I realized I wanted to get my master's degree. And I came to Art Center um, Graduate Media Design Practices. And I think that was a really wonderful moment for me to fuse what I learned primarily in MSR, working directly with computer scientists and um, being able to stay at Art Center after and teach um, really helped me bring those, um, my interests from an experience from MSR um, into education. And about six years now, I think the Immersion Lab has been around. Um, we started it a while ago as a way to really give access at the college for both faculty and students to emerging technology primarily spatial computing or what we also think of as mixed reality, including VR, AR, XR, all the different terms in between. Um, so it is a space dedicated um, to spatial interaction and spatial design. Um, and my role and my interests and primarily where I've been really focused the past few years in the lab is really creating more of a framework to sustain um, the emerging technology. So it's not just about bringing in equipment and using it or checking it out. And of course, that's part of the studio resources, but it's about really curating and thinking about how do we program that equipment. Um, and so it's really about engaging students and faculty in emerging technology through the medium itself, through hands-on experience. Um, so we try and really um, support both studio resources. So have a space that we have. It's at 950, the building 950 on South Campus. Um, and we curate a software and high hardware library, which includes things from of course, Unity, Unreal, to um, Oculus Quest 2, to motion capture equipment, such as the perception neuron you're seeing here. Um, other software, including um, machine learning software like Runway ML, um, and all the, the other various uh, software that's constantly changing too. Um, so we try to acknowledge that and, and work through that. Um, and then another okay. aspect, that we've, and in those that I've taught with, we've really focused on is it's one thing to give access or make that easily more accessible, um, but how do you engage students and how to learn it? It can be so um, intimidating. And I think that's what I learned even in my career is that with emerging tech, sometimes you feel like this huge barrier of entry. Um, and I think the internet and YouTube has helped so much make, that more accessible, but I feel like that's the impact I can have as an educator is to really help artists and designers see where they can have impact within the field. Um, so we really try and focus on uh, a month long set of time where we just engage in technology centered research. Um, so we write assignments and tutorials and do workshops as kind of like a way in which to step somebody through and, and really show them the impact they can have immediately, um, which sometimes otherwise maybe takes longer to, to figure that out. So here you're seeing some examples of like moving prototyping right in the beginning um, of a process. And then from that comes outcomes um, can be maybe not what we would have thought coming into the class. And I think that's my favorite part is really 
um, helping students see that by starting with technology first, um, the concepts derived from that research would have never been something that maybe you started with in your own mind. And I think that's the impact of starting with technology-centered research um, is that the concepts are, are unique to those insights and the forms and the aesthetic communications. So here's an example um, of uh, Sarah and Leo and Jose's project with Google Daydream. And, um, and it was a class taught in collaboration with product design and I co-taught with uh, Leonard Wozniak. And this is a great insight that they came away with from that process where thinking about how do you design for kids and mixed reality is a real challenge between the headset and really thinking about tracking space is so invasive. So they really thought about shrinking down that space um, and thinking about anything brought within that mat then becomes trackable. So it's super clear to the user um, how they're engaging and when do they, where is the place of participation and when are they not participating within it um, versus tracking everything. Um, and then they also use mobile device or these extended screens to say, you know, of course you can track and then view that right in front of you, but you don't rely on that headset, which I think is maybe we start with always thinking XR and mixed reality has to include the headset. So that's something we also try to kind of question and instigate our assumptions. Um, and then finally, just wanted to touch on where we're going and studios that we've developed. And currently we're running one with Meta Reality Labs. Um, called Everything is Input, and that's with graduate media design practices where we're really thinking about um, augmented reality and the implications of computer vision where anything and everything within that field of view can then become an input. So how do we as designers wrestle with both the possibilities of that technology, which is amazing, but then equally the implications of how do we wrestle with privacy and power structures of somebody has a headset on and is recording and somebody doesn't, or what do you know their point of view as? Um, so feel really honored to be able to share this with everybody and have the opportunity to teach these courses at Art Center. Thank you, Jay. Yep, you can, you can applaud. All right, so I'll, I'll invite my, my guests to join me. I'm going to switch it up and sit on this side. Um, and then uh, Jenny and Younes, if you can join us via Zoom and loom over us. Let me start with, with a question that I think um, every single one of us has um, asked themselves. Um, how does one stay up to speed on digital technologies? You know, as a designer, as a, as a creative, um, tools uh, will change, you know, can change and, and will change, uh, it feels like in a, in a heartbeat, you have to um, continuously uh, experiment. Um, how, how do you develop a culture of curiosity and continuous learning uh, when you teach for yourself and, and when you teach? Yeah, for me, I think, you know, just like anything else, I would say part of it is, you know, always being interested in the interesting, you know, looking at what are the new things that are coming out as far as, you know, technologies and hardware, software, um, and then just being curious and really asking yourself, how can we utilize this to help in the process and workflow that we already have? Or how can it introduce like, you know, efficiencies in those workflows? And uh, I would say part of getting that into the classroom is really giving, you know, removing a lot of the traditional constraints that one might have in let's just say a 3D modeling class where, oh, we all have to use SolidWorks, you know, like uh, these days I've really been, you know, promoting, uh, you know, playing around with different, uh, you know, technologies and softwares that are better for certain things, right? Like uh, Gravity Sketch is such a cool, you know, such an awesome tool where it allows you to quickly, you know, experiment with scale without having to actually build those things physically. Um, and I can see that a lot of students are, you know, they get really excited when they can see how certain, you know, new technologies can really, uh, make things efficient, you know, and, and improve their workflow. 
Um, I know the discovery aspect is always tricky. So going to events like this, where people are talking about uh, new things that are happening, um, just getting out there. And to me, I remember, you know, when I first joined, you know, when I first attended Art Center as a student, I don't remember who said it, but I remember on the very first orientation day, they talked about, you know, being a good designer means uh, maintaining a heightened sense of awareness, right? Awareness of new things that are coming out, um, awareness in how people are using things and, and always thinking about, you know, how can things be better? How can we improve this? And to me, I feel like um, the continuous learning um, in the classroom is all about, you know, promoting the diversity of tools that you're you're trying to use in your process and allowing yourself to be experimental at this time because a lot of times when you get out in the industry you know they have certain software that's all been approved and this is what you need to use and the engineers are using it designers are using it so you're kind of stuck there in that moment in some ways but as a student i do think it's a really exciting time to really look at, you know, what are these new opportunities through technologies that are emerging? And how do you get creative with how you implement those into your workflow? I love that. Um, maybe this is a question for you, for you, Ness. Um, I wonder how do you, pref uh, how do you prepare future creatives to make the most of digital technology, um, to contribute, to collaborate, um, with, you know, sometimes with teams or individuals who are um, maybe not halfway around the world, but, but pretty close. Um, and all that, regardless of their culture, their background, or their geographic location. So what, what role does technology play in, in that? When you, when you work with Francis, I have my, my own company and I, I worked uh, for, for different kind of clients. It's true that the technology was part of uh, of my everyday life because uh, um, being in Morocco, you are not in the center of uh, of what's going on in design. So basically, uh, when I'm with students or when I'm with, uh, when I'm doing workshop, it's true that the idea of using the, the tools uh, uh, and to be able to understand what tools to choose and how to use it Uh, for you, uh, for you, um, for for reaching people, for explaining your work, because at the end of the day, what you're doing is it, it's to to um, to explain and to show what you, your creation, to tell the story through the through all the tools you have, and it can be with your clients, it can be with the people who's going to produce your design, and every time you have to adapt. And I must say that. Um, I never worked uh, in a company. I worked for different company. And I, I could do, uh, as I told you, set design, hotel, restaurant, furniture. And every time when I had a client, it was challenging for me to find the tool, the perfect tool to use to explain my project, to, to, um, to, 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 to tell my story. So as I said during my presentation, it's... Um, Sometimes I realized that uh, uh, 3D rendering wasn't, wasn't a thing. Uh, uh, I thought that they will understand my object, but it was too clean, too perfect. Uh, so I use uh, the iPad and Procreate and I start drawing uh, and because it was easier for them to understand. So... Every time I talk with students, I talk with, uh, the idea is to try to find a way to find tools to express your idea, to tell the story and to be able to share with people um, what you have in your head and what you want to do and what is your vision, basically. Connect that thought. Something that you talked about is like the act of sketching, you know, something that like The difference at a rendering, it feels that those that you're collaborating with, right, don't feel like they can even impact it. It feels done, you know? And I, so I, I always think about that with like prototyping, the act of prototyping. It gives somebody a quick experience of something, but it's rough. And I think talking about that with students sometimes of like, why choose something that's a lower fidelity enables more people to contribute or collaborate because they feel like they see that it's not done, 
through the formal decisions of it feels rougher. So it feels like I can have input and change it still. And so I really like that connection as you brought up of the sketch and how I think about with a prototype and the opportunities it provides to develop further learning and insight and continuously make the project better. Yeah, that, this is a topic that that came up in the previous conversation, and I think it's a really important one because um, when you think about, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do, as Yuna said, you're telling the story of your idea, right? You're 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 presenting a concept, you're presenting a um, an idea that ultimately will manifest itself. Um, it's it's very very tempting to get to a point where you know you generate an initial doodle and then you end up rendering it and then you know whoever is is responsible for making the decision says yes that but you're like wait I, you know we're not there <laughs> like what do you think of the, you know this is just to show this and i think it's it's even more so the case when you think about um interactions when you when you think about interfaces when you think about digital products rather than may, maybe uh, physical products um and um, and I, you know the the topic of digital prototyping is I, is I think one one that maybe Jenny you you're you're quite quite involved in uh, because I've you know I've seen you teach and I've seen work coming out of your class and and this is something that that definitely uh, comes uh, comes through. And maybe maybe just one point to add to to that it's kind of interesting that sometimes people don't want to show their initial sketch doodle you know, the little one in their notebook, because they, they want to show the more polished, finished thing. Uh, but just kind of what, like, Younes was saying, it's like, sometimes showing something that's too perfect uh, also isn't correct. Like, you need to give people the space to comment or interpret what they see as your initial sketch. Uh, and in many cases, you want to show kind of the all of them. But um, I think it's it's something that maybe younger designers need to to be more comfortable with. Like, it's okay to show you know, your initial thought sketch, you know, and, and, and let it just be relevant for what that is. We, we actually encourage them to show more of the process and less of the, the finished polished renderings, yeah. right? This is something that as a student, I, I remember, you know, I would, I would kind of put away my, my napkin sketches and my, my doodles and, and just try to, you know, focus on, on the, the finished beautiful renderings. But, yeah. um, I think now more than ever, um, employers um will will hire you for your process not yeah, for your yeah. your final design right um Absolutely. and then i think that brings up a good point like just the amount of time put into something you know like to get the finished piece or a render maybe perhaps that takes you longer versus a quick prototype or a sketch it takes less time and so maybe you're not wasting time committing to a point or an idea that in the end maybe you throw out anyways so I think it's a way to be kind of like strategic about how you use your time um, and I know I have discussions with students to maybe your first question too around that kind of commitment to learning a new technology or software I know a lot of times it's that negotiation of going well is this going to be a waste of my time I go through all of this and is it really going to have that impact that it's so claimed or am I really going to learn something? And so I feel like there's always that tension in the creative process. I have a perfect example for a, a story I can tell and a perfect example for people to understand the, the, this exact point. Um, lately, it was a few months ago, I work for a client and there is what you have to understand in Morocco, there is a huge generational gap between, uh, so between generation. So it means that um, uh, you have lots of uh, kids that are growing up and, and take the company of the parents. But what you have to understand is that the parents, what they use as a tool is absolutely not the same as the, as the son is, is using. And I did this project. So it was a restaurant, a big restaurant, big project for this uh, guy who, who is taking the, the business of his parents. So I was doing 3D rendering and everything. And he was, he completely understand the project. He, we, we go through all the validation and he said to me, you know, I want to show the project to my parents because, you know, it's an heritage. I, I, I will 
I will take the what they build. So I want I want to share them exactly what we are what we are doing. And he showed them the three D render, and they 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 freak out because they 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 really didn't understand. They feel they felt trapped in the project. So he asked me, he called me, and he said, uh, "Can can you do a, a drawing, like a quick drawing of the project?" I literally take my three D render, went in Photoshop, use a plugin to create a fake drawing based on the three D render, and I send the picture a couple minutes after. And the parents look at the drawing generated, fully generated by the plugin in Photoshop and felt more oh. comfortable with the project and could understand everything. So I, I, I sorry to, uh, to, to jump in the conversation, but it's a perfect example of what we are saying. The idea is to, 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 to be able to share your vision, to tell the story. And the the tools you're gonna use is just about how you're gonna share your story and how you're gonna tell the story, and the thing is like you can easily be trapped by the tools you're using. So you, it's a battle as a designer. I'm sure people understand what I'm saying, but it's a battle to to not fall in the in the in the comfort of some tools that are uh, that are that helps you to design, and sometimes you have to. Uh, to change the perspective and trying to push the limit and stick with your vision, stick with the story you want to tell. This is actually a really good, really good point, a really good segue as we talk about creative control and as, as we talk about some of these AI tools that basically, you know, spit out visual content that, that some people take at face value, but others, um, maybe more discerning, you know, build on. Um, and, and so the topic of creative control using technology, I think, is a really important one, right? Um, as you said, Younes, it's really easy to let the technology dictate the creative output of your process, depending on, you know, depending on what tool you use, depending on, on, on you know, your, your choices in, in software, the, your choices in medium, um, the output might look very, very different from, from what you initially intended. Um, so how do you, how do you win that battle? You know, how do you, it's a, it's a tug of war, uh, you know, in order to, to maintain this creative control as a, as a designer, right? I, we had a conversation actually about this in my class yesterday. So it's like top of mind where we were having this same debate kind of going, well, how do we feel about that as creatives have seen like the easiness of somebody just being able to like put out a drawing or a rendering and. And it was brought up with such a good point of like, we we're all kind of admitting, well, I enjoy my craft too, you know? So it's not about displacing. I still will make a drawing or I still will work in a 3D modeling program and I still enjoy the process of it. Um, so it's a tool in which perhaps you could scale up, especially if we got it to a point where you can train the model on your own data set or your own content and then that would be great to be like okay more like this but towards me not another person's style so I think it's always that tension with design where we came out of this history of craft right and always have this tune with how do you reach scale you know and we're always in that dialogue and so I feel like that constant debate with new tools of like okay yes does they get rid of us you know this is does the designer is are we still needed with this tool? But I think it we still are, and that we're still influenced, and we still enjoy the act of making and working with our the medium. So, not necessarily an answer, but I guess it's like both. Well, maybe I'll jump in, and it's kind of a funny thing where I remember a few years ago just thinking about AI and what it might be able to do, and and one of the comments somebody made was like, "Well, it'll never replace design." You know, there's no way it can be like that smart to like design things. And then you see some of these tools coming out now where they're just mashing up a ton of images to create the next iteration of something. And it's really kind of what you do in the studio where you've got to look at what you did before. You got to look at the future and you got to kind of arrive somewhere to something new, but familiar. I mean, like an iPhone is not each time revolutionary, but it's like a slight advancement and a lot of new technology that goes in there. But um, yeah, like these tools can be a little bit scary to think that like, you know, maybe they will take over your job in some way. But I think the thing that Jeff showed earlier, um, 
the style gan where it kind of is creating reference images out of a few things that you then take and interpret. I think for me, that was like one of the coolest uh, applications of like AI and some of these tools where like it's, it's supportive of your process, not removing you from it. Um, so that's a interesting thing that I, I think maybe more designers should look into because it is, it is very easy to see the same reference images on every project. Yeah. Everyone's kind of grabbing really the same really, things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to build on that, I think, you know, the concept of control, I think, is something to think about. It's like because we all know about those happy accidents that happen, right? Um, thinking about, you know, Bob Ross and, you know, his happy accidents paintings. And um, for me, I feel like there's so much you can learn from the unexpected and things that you don't really know. You're not pre-planning. But to me, I think the control part happens where you figure out what do you do with this? You know, now that you have this power to mix images or you have this power to render things quickly or you have this power to create um, these super curated images based on, you know, verbiage, like how do you how do you use it? How do you utilize it? And you still, as the designer, um, I feel like you're always making those decisions. And what I think people care about the most is why why you're making the decision, right? And until AI can tell you why it made a certain decision, I'm not sure if it's gonna be able to do what we do. And to me, what I talk to a lot of my students about is because we really look at form a lot, right? Like as designers, we know that function is important, but we also need to think about the form and aesthetics. And to me, I'm always, you know, asking my students, like, what is the function of form? What is the function of style, right? Like, obviously, form has a function, but does the style of that form also have a function? When we look at objects, they make us feel a certain way. Like, oh, this object is tough. This object is comfortable or is going to last long or is going to be high performance or it's going to be comfortable to wear or hold or use, right? So I think... Like as designers, as long as we're aware that we're the ones who are making the decisions on what we, what language and what we want our products to speak to our end users, I feel like that's the control that we need. But maybe when it comes to the process, like, you know, getting a little out of control can be fun and produce unexpected results. I think, you know, it's funny because when the automobile was invented, we didn't stop, we didn't stop walking, right? So as creatives, um, you know these new technologies are gonna are, are gonna come in, are gonna are gonna, you know, appear, are gonna kind of disrupt our our, our space. Um, I'm I'm fairly confident that that as designers we have the mental capability to find creative ways to use this technology to to our advantage, you know, as opposed to uh, be threatened by it. So um, I, I'm sure there'll be a lot more. Uh, conversations around this topic in the future, but um, I'm I'm looking at Max. How much time do we have? Do we have time for a couple of questions? Uh, maybe one, one or two questions. All right. Uh, All right. We're gonna get kicked out in ten minutes, so <laughs> make them count. Anybody in the audience? If not, I have um, I have a question for all four of you. Um, using one word, one word, uh, can you describe your feelings about the future of creative tech? And I'll start with uh, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> is, that you, is that your word? <laughs> you hit me first. I'm going to be so mad at you. <laughs> the thing is, sometimes it's easier to be first to go rather than last to go. Yeah, I thought about trying to pick one word and I couldn't. I just, I, I couldn't pick a single word. I just want to echo what was last said, medium and craft. <laughs> Multiple words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't follow the rule. Okay, you're breaking them. An artist. <laughs> All right, Eunice. Yes. Um, yeah, it's very difficult, uh, this kind of uh, question that you have just one word to say, but um, I would say experimentation 
because it's part of the of the design process, not less and not more than that. Um, because to to follow the, the the discussion we we had, I remember when I was a student, it was the not the birth of three D printing of rapid prototyping, typing, but it was it was the beginning. And I remember in 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 school talking about that, being afraid of what we can do, but uh, how we can, is, is going to change the, the everything. Then uh, we had all these uh, um, 3D uh, uh, um, application that helps you to, to make. And I remember our teacher saying, don't use the first two years of your school. I don't want you to open a, a computer. You have to draw, you have to do this. And every time it was very frustrating for us because it, we felt as tool that help us to experiment. So I think the future of everything is about experimentation and what we can do with it and how we can use this, those tools to express our ideas and to share our ideas. Love it. Parker? All right. Um, yeah, think, thinking about this and, and kind, of, kind of as it relates to um, things that we consider when we're designing, um, you know, vehicles at, at, at Volvo, but also just in general, like um, how software should be for uh, how the students are using it or how they need to get others to use it. And the word I was thinking of is seamless. And it's really about like when we design full vehicle exterior and interior concepts, you know, the idea that you get in the vehicle and go, you know, and I think in the example of the tall vehicle that I showed the TO where it's like, there, in that vehicle, if you look into that project a little more, there's no steering wheel. You just kind of, the door opens, you step inside and, and it just goes, you know, and it doesn't really disrupt your day or your workflow. And it's just an extension of like, you're on your phone here and then you're in the car and now you've got all the same information. It's just seamless. And I think for a lot of like the VR experiences that we do, whether it's for design on a daily basis or it's when we need to get the executives at the company involved, you know, you've got to be able to take somebody into this digital world and just allow them to experience the concept or the, the feeling of it or the idea. You don't want them to be thinking about the technology. And in many cases we're doing like VR experiences for an hour, you know, or 90 minutes, you know, with people in Sweden and, and other places. And, you know, you need to be able to just allow people to seamlessly get into that world with you and just experience what you want to talk about and not run into any, any issues that you might have with the technology, which is getting better every year. Yep. Jeff, you've had the most time. You have yep, no excuse. Yep. I was thinking, definitely. And to me, I, I will cheat a little bit. It is two words. So sorry. Um, I would think, for me, it's about adopt and adapt, right? So those two words together. And to me, what that means for me is, you know, f looking at what's out there and asking yourself, which one of these new technologies should I adopt into my workflow, right? And then the second is adapt, meaning like, how do I adapt this to fit kind of the needs of, of what I need to get done, right? And I think Dewey's example of his StyleGAN project is a really great example of him adapting that technology of you know machine learning and mixing imagery. And he used it in a way that nobody really expected. And uh, you know, the class that he did that in, it's like, you know, a lot of students are, you know, you're supposed to just work on one project, design one thing. Um, but he's like proposing, oh, I want to do these experiments and mix images and see like where that gets me. And to me, I think having that spirit um, of curiosity and, you know, kind of like what Rob talked about earlier today about being scared and having fear, it's like, you know, being scared of new things can really trap you in where you are, right? So you definitely want to be able to be open to learning about what's out there and figuring out what to adopt and then, you know, getting creative with how you adapt that into your workflow. I like that. Very cool. Um, so I have the benefit of having asked the question so I know what answer I could give. For me, the, the word that comes to mind is gratitude, you know? I'm, I'm grateful to be living in this time where things change so fast. It's scary at times, but it's also very exciting. You know, we, we are so connected. We are, um, you know, information uh, can be exchanged. Ideas can be exchanged. Um, 
you know, we, we as a society and uh, as humanity have amazing tools at our disposal to rethink the way we do things, you know, think that, make, um, do them better, um, connect more, you know, in the right way. Um, so I think, I think, uh, you know, gratitude is the word that, that comes to mind. And, um, by extension, I am grateful to have been given the opportunity to, uh, to fac facilitate this conversation. And I wanted to thank, uh, our esteemed panelists, uh, for taking the time to, um, you know, to call in, to be here, uh, to chat with us and, uh, also for, um, the, um, the participants in the audience for, for making the time. Um, I'd like to thank Art Center, um, Christine, Robbie, and Max for, um, you know, for helping supporting the organization of this, this day specifically, which, uh, which, you know, was, was on a topic that I'm very passionate about, but, um, Creative Tech Week continues, you know, this is only, only day three. Uh, feel free to check out the, the schedule for the next sessions. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, and remember to stay curious. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir.